We have been reading the spooky story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. And we left off where Ichabod Crane was going from house to house of the families of his pupils carrying his belongings in a white handkerchief. And we'll pick up that it's explaining about how this worked for the families. That all this might not be too onerous on the purses, too expensive, of his rustic patrons, who are apt to consider the cost of schooling a grievous burden, and schoolmasters as mere drones. He had various ways of rendering himself both, both useful and agreeable. He assisted the farmers occasionally in the lighter labor of the farms, helped to make hay, mended the fences, took the horses to water, drove the cows from pasture, and cut wood for the winter fire. He laid aside also all the dominant dignity and absolute sway with which he lorded it over his little empire, the school, and became wonderfully gentle and ingratiating. He found favor in the eyes of the mothers by petting the children, particularly the youngest, and like the lion bold, which Willem so magnanimously the lamb did hold. <laughs> he would sit with a child on one knee and, a rock, and rock a cradle with his foot for hours on end. In addition to his other vocations, he was the singing master of the neighborhood and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folk in psalmody, or singing religious songs. It was a matter of no little vanity to him on Sundays to take his station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers where, in his own mind, he completely carried away the, the palm from the parson. <laughs> Certain it is, his voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation, and there are peculiar quavers still to be heard in that church, which may even be heard half a mile off, quite to the opposite side of the mill pond, on a still Sunday morning which are said to be legitimately descended from the nose of Ichabod Crane. Thus by divers, little makeshift in that ingenious way, which is commonly denominated by, by hook and crook, by hook and by crook, the worthy pedagogue teacher got on tolerably enough and was thought by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork, uh oh, to have a wonderfully easy life of it. <laughs> the schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood, being considered a kind of idle gentleman-like personages of vast superior st uh, taste and accomplishment. <laughs> Uh, let's see, to the rough country swains. So compared to the country guys, he was very admirable. And indeed inferior in learning only to the parson. Mm, the only more important person was the preacher, okay. His appearance, therefore, is apt to occasion some little stir at the tea table of farmhouses and the addition of supernumerary dish, dish of cakes or sweetmeats or peradventure the parade of a silver teapot, our man of letters, therefore, was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels. How he would figure among them in the churchyard between services on Sundays, gathering grapes for, for them in the wild vines that overrun the surrounding trees, reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones, or sauntering with the whole bevy of them along the bank of the adjacent mill pond, while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back, envying his superior elegance and address. From his half itinerant life, itinerant, itinerant means you move around. 
He also was kind of a traveling gazette, carrying the whole budget of local gossip from house to house so that his appearance was always greeted with satisfaction. He was, moreover, esteemed by the women as a man of great erudition, for he had read several books quite through and was a perfect master of Cotton Mather's History of New England, in which, by the way, he most firmly and potently believed. He was, in fact, an odd mixture, mixture of small shrewdness, shrewdness and simple credulity. His appetite for the marvelous and his powers for digesting it were equally extraordinary. And both had been increased by his residence in the spellbound region. No tale was too gross or monstrous for his capacious swallow. He liked a scary story. It was often his delight after school was dismissed in the afternoon to stretch himself on a bed of rich clover bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse and there con over old Mather's direful tales. Let's see if we can see. Well, there's the stream. Direful tales, scary tales until the gathering dusk of the evening, evening made the print a mere mist before his eyes. Then, as he wended his way by swamp and stream and awful woodland to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered, staying, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination. The moan of the whippoorwill from the hillside, the boding cry of the tree toad, that harbinger of storm, the dreary hooting of the screech owl, or the sudden rustling of the thicket of birds frightened from their roost. The fireflies, too, which sparkled most vividly in the darkest places now uh, and then startled him as one of uncommon brightness which stream across his path. And if by chance a huge blockhead of a beetle came winging his blundering flight against him, the poor varlet was ready to give up the ghost with the idea that he was struck with a witch's token. His only resource on such occasion, uh, on such occasions was uh, either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits was to sing psalm tunes. And the good people of Sleepy Hollow, as they sat by their doors of an evening, were often filled with awe at hearing his nasal melody in linked sweetness long drawn out, floating from the distant hill or along a dusky road. So, he gets scared. He loves the scary stories, but he gets scared, especially if he takes too long and is walking home in the dark. Okay, we'll continue on to see what happens to Ichabod, the lover of scary stories, in this tale of Sleepy Hollow.